So I would like to welcome my panelists, um, Tomasz Kaczmarczyk from uh, Indie by the co-creator of Superhot. Uh, Hi, hello everybody. Maciej Kut from uh, GameFound. Hello, good to be here. Thank you. And Piotr Gamrasi from Vivid Games. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, guys. Gamrasi, I, I really like that. Gamrasi is nice, yeah. Um, so our panel, we we went, because we discussed before the panel uh, what we will be talking about, and we don't want to focus entirely on, I don't know, what type of game you should create in order to you know become a hit. We want to make a bit wider uh, wider topic. I would like to start uh, with what is a hit game? What, what does it mean to create a hit game? Maybe, maybe Piotr, you will start. Yeah, so it's actually funny because for the last two years we had like in our strategy um, that we, what we are aiming is like to create hit game and we define that as a game which generates like $1 million uh, gross revenue monthly. Uh, and of course, we never reached this goal. <laughs> so, so I have no idea how to create hit games. So, uh, so don't expect me to give you like a, a ready-to-go recipe for that. Uh, but I think it's, it's very for from from studio to studio. It depends on your si uh, size of the studio. It depends where you are. Like, like for small studios, like you know, hit can mean that you know you 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 sold like i don't know 1000 copies of your game and that's fine but for studios like uh, rovio whatever supercell when you generate like 1 million dollars monthly from from game is the failure so it really depends where you are and you know what you what you what you expect um so yeah that's that's my answer like hit games means completely different for different people tom uh, yeah, yeah. So, so it is. It is very interesting um, what uh, what Pierre was saying uh, because the perspectives that you'll hear from this panel and the ways that we disagree will be absolutely fantastic because we're each from an entirely different story. Uh, Piotr is doing mobile games, so um, um, like uh, monthly revenue actually matters, and somebody actually tracks that, and somebody counts those numbers. Uh, and, and then um, uh, we've got uh, board games and we've got premium PC console VR games represented as well, where, again, the numbers are weird and different. Sometimes you're not even thinking in terms of numbers. You're thinking in entirely different, in entirely different terms. So, yeah. Yeah, but do you think Super Hot was a head game? Oh, with, without a doubt. Absolutely. I'm, I mean, across every dimension imaginable, it was a, a hit game. And if you ask me what, what led to that success, I can name probably a hundred different things uh, that went excellent for us, that were very fortunate and we were lucky to be able to accomplish them. And maybe a few of them actually mattered. I, I don't know. And I, none of them would be easy to replicate. Getting a rule book is not really something that you can that you can get. But hopefully, you know, over the course of this panel, we'll be able to come up with some uh, general directional truths, trends of what might increase your chances anecdotally uh, from the three random people on stage here. <laughs> Machi, you want to add something? Yeah, I feel like like if I were out of place here because uh, I'm surrounded by guys who really made the games and I have never done like made a single game in my life but like from a perspective of player maybe uh, I would say and also from the perspective of a guy who like look looking is looking at the um, industry I would say that hit, hit game is something that governs the community that is actually waiting for the next one that is interested in what you're doing and it's it can actually it can help you build something more on on the first game so it actually is exactly aligned with what uh, Piotr said that hit game it really depends on the scale of where you are right now but uh, thanks to that uh, if you are a blizzard and you're making something that is good so it's definitely not a hit game for you 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 aim only for the best Okay, so I would take a step back to what you said, Tom, about uh, that some things 
worked out in in uh, in super hard what is the secret sauce the, the secret formula you can share with us about what worked what doesn't work is money important influencers what, what is important in creating a game yeah i mean uh the secret sauce and the formula is to get everything right on your first try <laughs> Uh, yeah, easy. Easy. Uh, and uh, there is, I mean, in other words, there, there, I don't think there is an actual formula that you can follow. There are steps you can take or things you can be aware of that may limit the risk, that may change the risk profile for your for your production. And sometimes uh, very, it, it extremely depends on your actual project, but let's look at indie game development. When we were making Super Hot uh, eight years ago, uh, the landscape was entirely different. Back then, it was um, uh, Super Hot was one of the last projects to go through Steam Greenlight. So you still had to demonstrate following, demonstrate a community before you were allowed to sell your game on Steam. And that meant that once you passed string Steam Greenlight, you actually, you, you basically won already. Like there, there's very few titles that went through that process and then flopped because you had such a limited number of titles on Steam, you, you already had kind of a guaranteed audience that would be exposed to your, to your title. Nowadays, you've got 10,000 games shipping on Steam every year, so the math doesn't work out quite as, quite as well. And you have to find other ways to stand out, to, to emerge uh, above the noise. So the best practices and takeaways, learnings that I can share from Superhot, some of them might be interesting, but n not, not many of them will be applicable to game development now. And especially if you're now starting to develop a game and thinking to ship it in like three years, that is going to probably be again a different landscape altogether. Piotr, wanna add something? Yeah, so uh, usually what Tom said is like, you know, when you, you play lottery, you need to cross the right numbers, you know? <laughs> so it's easy. <laughs> uh, but the truth is like uh, that there is no recipe for, for the uh, hit game, to be honest, uh, timing matters like a lot and luck matters like a lot. What you can do is like just to uh, think about the risk and min min minimize the risk uh, at the time you are, and that's you know what matters. Okay, like. so so how to minimize the risk? What what so, what move? What, what you should do to minimize so, the risk? Again, it depends on the, uh, on the studio and you know, what kind of capital you have as a studio and so on. When you look at you know, studios like Ubisoft, you know, why they do like, you know, Assassin's Creed uh, 25 you know, and, and, and so on. It's like, because you know, they have a like, very, uh, very well-known like, franchise uh, committee and so on. They, they really know that they, even if they're gonna go, if they're gonna do a like, crappy game, you're gonna uh, hit the sale because it's very well known, like franchise and so on. So that's one of the way how to mi minimize the uh, the risk. Of course, you know you look at the trends, you look at the data, and you see, oh, okay, right now, right now, hyper casual games. I'm talking about the mobile game uh, right now. Is something you know you should like chase. Uh, but you know when you start like developing a game, you know the entire process is one like one year ago, one one year later the market is completely different. So you already late. So uh, so uh, so yeah, like when you look at the when you look at the uh, risk, it's more or less like about what capital you have in in your studio. Maybe you have like very uh, well known uh, IP you can capital capitalize on. Maybe you have like uh, tech. I don't know you build like game with this kind of feature. Maybe it's uh, better for you to build similar game with different setting, but capitalize on the features or tech you already have within the studio because it's like smaller. Uh, so things, uh, things like that. You know, uh, there is no th there is no recipe for that. So no. <laughs> Yeah, there's, there's, there's just give some answers. They, 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 they expect something. They expect the the blood or, or anything. You know, uh, I, I want to like maybe like uh, the, the, the one of the famous like for me like the uh, the examples like uh, I, I'm sure if I should say that I probably no, but I would tell it anyway. It's like Colibri games. Like uh, they they like build like this idle mining tycoon. Like 
you know, four guys, you know, uh, sitting in one uh, one room, you know, studying together, they built uh, Idle Mine and Tycoon. And you know, apparently that was like completely uh, amazing game. Like you know, millions of players like developed and uh, sorry, do, do download the, this game. You know, they started generating enormous amount of money. They started like hiring people, like uh, over 100 people, uh, employees, and so on. Uh, super nice. So they they said, hi, we have this like recipe for like creating like super successful the game but the question is have you ever repeat the success well no <laughs> so you know so maybe that was the just uh, lack good timing and whatever that's also like you know the uh, nice uh, a nice skill actually to be honest uh, to be in the uh, right place in right time uh, um, uh, but yeah it, it shows a bit like you know that's uh, mostly in our industry is based on the on the timing and luck you know show me the studio who is able to repeat success like every whatever year every second year and so on maybe apart super sell but uh, uh, yeah it's very hard like to produce like Heat, uh, uh, overheat, and so on. Okay, so I'll add as a person who is like independent here because I have like no experience in that. So I will tell you. So you're an indie, okay? The, ex <laughs> the, ex really exact, indie. the exact formula for a uh, hit game. These are actually two uh, formulas. One is listen to your to the feedback of your community, please them, do everything they ask you to do because they will play your game. And the second uh, option is don't care at all about what they are saying because you know better, uh, and they will find out that you know better after you release the game. So yeah, these are both ways that can work. <laughs> all right, yep. but that's actually uh, very funny because there are two like approaches here. Like uh, you're listening to the community, and then when like people like our studios like uh, tell me, hey, we're like uh, community is for very important for us. We will listen to the community and so on. I mean like, okay, so you are aiming, you know, I don't know, to hear like. 10 million uh, sales, you know, so it means like at least like 10 uh, million uh, players uh, are there and you are listening to every single one. All right, that's a really nice structure. <laughs> yeah, I, I think uh, this is actual, actual, uh, probably very bland, but actual piece of advice that you can, you can uh, glean from this. That if you can, then maintaining a healthy community before your game is shipped is actually valuable now. And that is, I think, actually an expression of a trend. So we are actually on topic here. Yeah, nice. That, you know, 10 years ago, it was enough to just be on the platform because there was nobody else there. So you had a spot on the store and you would already win. Now you have to compete with 10,000 other games that were shipped this year, then one of the probably most effective ways to do it is to have a built-in community like a, 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 a following of players that will actually guaranteed buy your game when it ships and that is something that you can actually nurture and build through crowdfunding campaigns through uh, through steam next fest demos through various ways of trying to pull people into your into your uh, orbit and then you can forge it into, from sort of indie game development or self-publishing perspective, you can forge it into a lower chain chance of absolute flop when you launch, uh, or into actual uh, offset of the, of the risk of a potential flop by, for example, selling your game into Game Pass. Right, there you have options to basically get a small, small pile of money for uh, your game before it's launched. Uh, and to do that, you have to demonstrate that the game is actually good. And the easiest way to do it is that there are people excited about it. There's wish lists on Steam, that there is a community on Discord, that there are people following you on Twitter, whatever. Like any signal you can get to, to demonstrate that you have something that people are actually actively interested in, that gives you a better position to offset any risk of the, of the launch. You have higher success, higher chance of actually succeeding, and you've got an easier way of uh, just getting some of the revenue front-loaded through exclusivity deals or Game Pass deals or similar deals if you, if you choose to do so. Now we are talking. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we will talk about crowdfunding in a bit, but I know that Piotr have a different view on crowdfunding the game itself, how you can use crowdfunding to finance the, the, the game itself, the mobile game or the PC game. 
so like that's not something I would chase to be honest like uh, and not because I don't believe in that and so on I'm probably probably I'm in a different place right now um, uh, I think we need to understand and that's good and bad at the same time that if you go in the direction of like crowdfunding does the check for your game if you're gonna fail I don't know Kickstarter campaign and so on then it's gonna be extremely hard for you to go, I don't know, to VC investors and so on and ask for money because you already shown that your game has no interest in. So, uh, so that's the risk and to understand that there is risk like that. Uh, I believe that this uh, event, like, you know, I know this macroeconomic uh, situation right now is maybe not the best one for us, but I still believe there's like a lot of uh, money on the market and uh, it's easier to go to the investors uh, if you have like right team and the right uh, vision for the product and uh, ask for support for you then go to the uh, crowdfunding campaigns like that that's my view i believe that's mm, less complex than going to the crowdfunding campaigns I, I think the key here is that it is less scary because you can iterate. If you're just doing publisher pitches to get funding for your game, you can fail one, you can fail the second one, you can improve your pitch and then you can try again. If you're doing this out in the open by starting a Kickstarter campaign, uh, I mean you basically get one shot. Like you can try to test it before, talk to your friends, demo the page, mock review the, the Kickstarter page, it takes effort but you can still do it. But ultimately, you press the button to launch the campaign and that's it. And that, that's when you start praying that it actually works. But if, if there would be success on the crowdfunding campaign, wouldn't it be easier to find investors? Yeah, let's say you, you went to the open and you published so your game. I, I think like if you succeed with the crowdfunding campaign, uh, then you have completely different starting point with uh, you know talking to the uh, uh, investors because you already shown that you know it makes sense you know so so it's already validated somehow so uh, so investors would be uh, more uh, willing to invest uh, and so on uh, but that's of course risky because what if you fail? <laughs> you want to add something about kind of crowdfunding or? or? Actually, yeah, I will explain my existence here in this panel yeah. because I do know a few things about crowdfunding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, and paradox, because uh, paradox is that I am a huge evangelist for crowdfunding. Uh, however, I would absolutely agree with uh, Piotr that crowdfunding is not a good way to fund a video game because of uh, many reasons, but the main one is that cr vi uh, creating video games is crazy, crazy expensive right now. And uh, our uh, industry, uh, video game industry, is the industry that is focused on like, the, you know, price cuts, uh, promotions, Steam sales, etc. So, and crowdfunding is for completely different type of uh, human beings. Because if you're, uh, like, imagine you have a person that is willing to pay money right now today for something that will or not will be delivered to that person in two years and you uh, and there are people that pay for example hundreds of euros uh, dollars uh, for for the promise of something being delivered to them and that kind of person is like it, we don't have too many common, like there's not, uh, not a huge common ground with people who are video gamers, who, who are used to promotions like, okay, I will wait a week after the, uh, the game launches so that I can get it half price, etc. So, uh, like, funding the game itself in crowdfunding is really for a very selected uh, few people in the world that can be successful. However, it is a really great tool and exactly as uh, Piotr said, uh, that it's a huge proof of, uh, of your visibility among your community, of your importance, if you launch a crowdfunding campaign and uh, it uh, generates some hype uh, community. But you, do not, you, don't, you shouldn't uh, launch your campaign for the game but once the game is almost ready, for example, so there is no risk that this, the game is not going to be delivered uh, to uh, to backers, customers, then creating a crowdfunding campaign 
just to entertain your crowd more, to offer them, for example, not the game, of course, the game itself also, but you don't promise them that if I don't fund, then the game is not going to happen, no. It's like, if I don't fund, then, for example, uh, in this game there won't be an additional, I don't know, word or, or something like, something that you can act safe on, that uh, only the things that, uh, that you're sure of um, can be delivered in that money that, you, that you're promising. Plus, uh, crowdfunding is also an awesome, awesome uh, way to sell uh, collector's editions. Crowdfunding nowadays is basically a pre-order with some additional perks like community engagement, uh, like hu huge hype. And, uh, if you, uh, and you don't risk anything if you sell your collector's editions through crowdfunding because you know exactly how many pieces you would need to produce. You don't need to care about um, you know, retail size, etc. because everything like that can be done in, uh, just straight, from out, uh, straight without any middleman uh, and go straight to uh, your customers. Piotr, buying into that? Are you buying into that? Into this? No, no, type of like that's uh, that's that's right. Like uh, it's different, different product, and uh, and perhaps completely different, different, uh, different way. Like uh, because you are talking mostly about the board games, to be honest. Like <laughs> so crowdfunding is maybe not only about, of course, uh, board. Uh, like uh, my company is based, uh, like uh, takes care mostly of board games, but crowdfunding is for physical items. Because digital is, people are so used to discounts in digital that it doesn't really like work in crowdfunding. But for physical items, something that you you are not used to discounts when you when it comes to collector's editions, figurines, uh, stuff like that. So that's why it's like, uh, and again, uh, people waiting two years for something uh, that uh, is uh, going to be delivered uh, to them uh, for crowdfunding. They are really waiting for something of exceptional value. They cherish the moment of unboxing, uh, of touching things. So as crowdfunding is like, we don't have any problems. I have never seen problems with like something being too expensive with crowdfunding. Of course, it's, uh, it may uh, lower the value of the entire campaign, but expensive is not that a big problem as a uh, lack of quality. So as long as you can deliver exceptional quality, something that people will love after they receive it, then your next campaign is going to be a huge success as well. Tom, looks like you want to say something? or because uh, I've actually got a question to you, Machi. Oh. Uh, in your uh, board game world, in the world of board games, do you see uh, or are you starting to see specific niches or like specific genres of board games to, 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 to evolve, to come up? Or is it still just one big soup of board games and the same type of customer buys them all? I think it's very similar to video games. So yeah, there are definitely different genres. And also it's very important to have this uh, like division into uh, also indie, but there are like very visible triple A titles in board games. Uh, and in crowdfunding again with board games, what's the like the average price you would pay for board game? Like what, what do you think that uh, like something that you would just take your wallet and pay straight away? Like 50 bucks, maybe? 50 bucks. Yeah, it's, a, it's perfect, actually, because 50 bucks is basically usually this borderline that mm, if you go to supermarkets, maybe not in Poland, but in Germany somewhere, so then you won't see games uh, that are more expensive than 50 bucks. It's like, it's, uh, it's a no-go for most uh, people. So uh, in crowdfunding, it's better to sell more expensive games, more unique ones, more, ex more expensive uh, and uh, exclusive, because uh, it's... It will all, crowdfunding will always be aimed at uh, like niche. It's not going to be something that you know uh, millions of people won't pledge for uh, for a crowdfunding campaign. But you don't know you don't want million people uh, to like it's it's not possible because people are like used to uh, different types of e-commerce. But if you want to uh, like sell something unique, something great, then crowdfunding is much better than retail because you just wouldn't be able to sell uh, a game, a triple A uh, board game uh, in a retail uh, at all, because nobody will buy it from you unless you have a successful crowdfunding campaign and you proved already that there are tens of thousands of people that paid two years in advance to get it. So then, of course, retailers are happy to join as well. So I, I think that's a that's a trend uh, that I, I I think we can coin it into a trend and actually keep keep on topic. Uh, and let's say something that you don't see 
very often in the games, like in digital games industry yet, but it is very obviously emerging and it's becoming more and more prominent where you're trying to find ways to monetize your customers at various tiers, especially trying to find ways to get uh, higher paying people who are more likely to pay less price sensitive to pay more for your games through random DLCs, collector's edition packages, special uh, battle passes and stuff like that. That is uh, hard to uh, plan for and hard to design around for smaller games, for indie productions, but you can still try and go for similar strategies if you, uh, if you, if you can find them because, well, like in, like in board games, you do see the stratification of consumers. Some people are willing to pay anything, anything really for a game that they want and that they like. They just want to play it and they don't care. Uh, and the vast majority are more price sensitive, but it is still on a, on a spectrum. And getting the, the price right is sometimes a function of how do you do discounting and how do you pricing, but sometimes it is a function of maybe you find different things to sell to different people. You find different packages for them. Yeah, so <clears throat> actually this is the, the the direction I would go with this panel. What is the direction of, um, what is the, the different ways to monetize the franchise? Because we see, for example, The Witcher, which is big game, but with The Witcher is an example of um, trying to monetize it on every level because there's a PC game, there's a mobile game, there's a card game, board game, a TV show, uh, anime. Clothing. Yeah, clothing. So. Is this something that indie gamers can, you know, learn from? Is it something that they even able to do it, or, or is it is it entirely for the triple A games? I don't think even CD Projekt has this these side uh, side businesses or like the side shows treated as actual business lines. I think it's mostly for uh, brand awareness and marketing. And if you were a successful indie studio, you might get away with some of this. Like if you were, uh, if you were Inner Sloth, which is Among Us, if you were, if you were um, Bone Loaf, which made Gang Beasts. Like these games are very popular. They are played by millions of people, and they have very recognizable characters that you can use for merchandising. And then you can actually, there are companies that will help you figure out how do you do your merchandising, how do you do uh, basically uh, toys for kids to buy in actual stores in a Walmart in America, and they will handle all the distribution for you. you. You don't really get significant revenue from that, at least compared to your actual game sales. The prerequisite is that your game is so popular that it's basically printing money. So at this stage, anything you can get from a regular brick and mortar store will be peanuts. Uh, but it does help with uh, well, marketing brand awareness probably props up the game a little bit. It makes it more of a cultural mainstay, I suppose. It gives it a longer tail. And it also makes, uh, it doesn't hurt that it also builds up your ego, that you can see a plush toy of your video game in, uh, in Walmart, for example. You want to add something, Tom? If, if not, I, I have, uh, sorry, Maci. Actually, uh, uh, I would like to add one thing, however, I kind of feel like uh, being a hammer, like everything looks like a nail, so I'm going to get back to crowdfunding again, sorry for that. Uh, but uh, when talking about expanding your brand, uh, so crowdfunding also, and probably like uh, the easiest, the uh, safest solution, can be also like um, marketing stunt for you, or PR stunt, because you can aim so high, you can create a, such a crazy campaign for a goal that is uh, like so interesting for uh, so that it can be media worthy because media will start writing about your crowdfunding campaign as long as it's crazy enough, uh, funny enough, or whatever. So even if you don't fund, uh, like if you have, for example, a campaign for let's say collector's edition, so you want to sell 100 collector's edition for like 100 dollars, but you also have uh, one reward tier, limited uh, limited edition of your collector's edition uh, that has uh, like a stock limit of one, and it costs ten thousand of dollars, and you just add something crazy to that. I don't have uh, an idea right now. Uh, so this will actually help you not only uh, like get money, but also get this visibility uh, in the industry. So uh, and recognition, basically. Um, one more. 
actually only for you, um, do you think that monetizing the, for example, PC game into board game, did we di are we directing the same people or are we just spreading it to more people? Who, who, who buys it? Because as, as you said, uh, the, the board games especially, you can make uh, the board game for 50 bucks, uh, but then there is like the 1,000 bucks as well. Who, who, who buys it? Is, it? is it something that grows your marketing even more, grows your uh, customers, or you using the same kind of people? So, um, of course, uh, like the number of video gamers is much, much larger. But, uh, so I would say that according to data, uh, like uh, service, etc., most uh, board game players are video game players, uh, and it usually goes uh, that way. Uh, and basically, uh, yeah, so uh, like creating your own board game is not as easy as it seems to be, like as, it's, uh, as it sounds. So it's like uh, you really need to, uh, if you are very good at creating mechanics uh, in video games, you may be quite good in board games. However, you still need to learn everything from scratch to, uh, to, do, to do that right. So there are, of course, two ways. As uh, Tomek said, uh, like license it. If you have somebody who like who knows how to do these games and basically uh, IPs sell uh, board games in a great great way, or you can create it by yourself. Uh, but really, even if you're a very successful um, uh, video uh, game developer, be humble about it because it's not that everything you're, you'll do <laughs> is going to be an instant hit. Uh, and that's why again I think that like if we are talking about expanding brand. Uh, Safer things are something that you know that you can deliver, like collector's edition, because you know that if you can model a sculpture and you can like, 3D print it and you see that, okay, it looks good, so then, yeah, you know that uh, you will deliver the quality of uh, you want. But if you want to create a board game and you test it on your few friends and all of them will say, yeah, hey, great, nice game, yeah, absolutely, I would buy it. So, yeah, it's a, a bit too, too, too risky. Okay, so basically the money and, and people, it's, it's, it's the secret sauce of gaming. Um, so there is, no ga there is no game without the gamers, so that raises a question, how important is, for, especially for indie gamers with uh, probably lack of funding, uh, how important it is to use social media or any other, or maybe you can share what kind of things to use to build a community over your game and how important it is to do it before launching the game. Uh, yeah, nowadays uh, TikTok is, is a thing I heard. Uh, <laughs> uh, and there are, uh, I mean, it's again, that is a fairly bland advice and a fairly obvious one, but there are multiple examples of people who um, went viral on TikTok, as in they, they, they were brave enough to actually post snippets of their games uh, on TikTok in ways that were engaging and entertaining and somehow managed to uh, end up prioritized and, and rewarded by the algorithm with hundreds of thousands of additional people looking at the game, which actually does translate to sales for at least some of those games. Uh, that definitely translates to the basic baseline brand awareness and wish lists, and that then can translate to, to actual sales. And uh, for the most part, what it does is gives you, um, gives you a, um, a mechanism, a tool, which forces you to think like a marketer during the production of your game. So you're, you, you, it breaks you out of the cycle of actually working on the game and thinking it's very cool because you're working on it and having to figure out how do I actually present it to other people in a way that will make them think it's cool. Uh, which is a, 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 a scary thing for a lot of people. And as, as, as Piotr mentioned, it is terrifying to put your project in front of others because what if it flops? Well, doing an entire Kickstarter campaign might be a bit too expensive for you to, to, to expect that it flops and you can still do something about it. But putting a TikTok and seeing that nobody cares, that is excellent feedback because maybe you need to change something in the game, maybe you need to change something in the way that you present it, but definitely you should not stay coarse. 
or you can change the medium because TikTok is a very good example of a medium that I don't know if you guys uh, anybody is working in e-commerce, but from my experience, TikTok, TikTok usually ads on TikTok, influence on TikTok, they give you a lot of lot of uh, views, a lot of impressions, a lot of clicks even, and zero conversion. Uh, while I have one uh, great example of a campaign uh, uh, that was uh, run, it was for a game uh, called uh, Watch Hockey Get Drunk. It was a very simple card game, which is basically like a, you know, a drinking game, so you just pick a card and if something happens uh, during the uh, hockey match, then you, uh, you take a shot. So, and uh, the campaign was not truly advertised a lot, but they did have one TikToker, like a huge one, who, uh, who published like a video about it, and it was absolutely crazy. So this was the, was the exact audience of TikTok, of this very simple, not really, not something that I would usually recommend for crowdfunding, because card games, something that should cost like few bucks, is not something that you expect from crowdfunding. But in this case, TikTok, it brought like, I don't really remember, I would need to check, but I think it was like hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, gathered on the campaign. Thanks to m mostly, I believe, one TikTok video. You wanna hear a crazy thing? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, Super Hot uh, also has a quasi-publishing arm, and we helped this one this one uh, card game uh, by some of the people working in the team originally, and it is a drinking card game. It's it's very cool. It's called Not Enough Mana, and you play wizards casting spells against against each other, and you you have to have mana to cast those spells, and you take shots to to refill your mana, uh, and you can also have too much mana, which is also a losing condition. Anyway, uh, the the game is excellent. It was very fun. Uh, they they went through a Kickstarter campaign. They were successful in that. It was selling okay afterwards as well, and then there was a TikTok. And uh, when, they, when somebody, when a specific, one specific creator on TikTok made a, a fairly generic video, really, about it, they immediately cleared the entire warehouse. They immediately ran out, of, ran out of units to ship. So maybe it's actually a pattern. Maybe if you're making a drinking game, you should just go for TikTok. Yeah, but on the other hand, I don't want to bring names, but um, I have a client a while ago who had himself 2.1 million uh, followers on TikTok. And he tried to, to create a game. Uh, he made a few TikToks about it, and it flops entirely. So I don't know if just based on views is, is as important, uh, because th they might not be your clients. So any you know, uh, secrets about how to measure before they pay, before clients pay, how you can measure if the idea is, is good. I think we have this third yeah, guy yeah, is sitting yeah. uh, quietly and he's a lot yeah, of I'm, I'm listening to you guys and like <laughs> for us like you know like we measure everything every day <laughs> we buy players we we know the cost of acquisition we know how much uh, this player is going to bring us a day free day 14 day 30 and, and so on so <laughs> I have no idea what to say <laughs> it's like you know uh something uh, what we do like every day uh but uh, what is like important, like uh, from that perspective, I would say, like, it, like listen to your community. That's one. But uh, uh, what is important, you mentioned like TikTok here, uh, because like many people like ignore TikTok for 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 many months. To be honest, uh, we need to, we need to understand uh, the channels uh, which are like effective, are actually uh, changing very often. To be honest, like right now, like TikTok is super. Uh, super great, for like at least for us, like in terms of the user acquisition and, and converting them to, to players and, and you know generating revenue. Uh, a few months ago, it was like Snapchat, like you know maybe Twitter, like uh, um, uh, you know a year ago, and, 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 and so on. So you need to be always like uh, up to date what works uh, uh, for you. Like uh, I remember like one one funny campaign. I will not mention the game because that was adult game. Uh, a few years ago, and we had this like crazy idea. Let's pay uh, this guy. I don't know, like P P U D I D I. I know this like YouTube or whatever. P U D I. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This fancy one, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and that was like crazy money because he requests requested something around, you know. Uh, all right, like. Uh, 
60 square meter apartment in Warsaw just for you know uh, three three minutes uh, video and you know uh, two. Uh, to post on Instagram and Twitter, you know, that was expensive, uh, but someone took this like crazy decision, and okay, let's pay him, you know, it's gonna be f funny, you know, to have this like fancy influencer like advertising our game. And then, of course, no one was prepared for this traffic, you know, we, we, we were like forced to, could, uh, to, to buy like a lot of more servers because we had like so many players, you know, <laughs> uh, injecting, injecting to, to our game and actually paying and so on. So that was worth, to be honest, like <laughs> sometimes it's, uh, it's worth to pay like 300 uh, K dollars to influencer uh, to play your game because apparently you're gonna generate like Almost 10 million dollars <laughs> from that traffic. So, uh, so, 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 yeah, it should be, be just like up to date and just adjust uh, uh, to the market at every point of your product life cycle. So, so for now, we've established that it's drinking games and adult games that do marketing well. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> trends. And it's good. Oh, I think we have m uh, movie games on the. <laughs> Uh, here on the uh, on the stage, so we can talk about adult games as well. <laughs> and it's also good to have like a spare apartment in Warsaw just to you know sell for a TikTok video. Sorry, not TikTok, but YouTube video. Uh, yeah, and I think I think one thing to pick up uh, from from all of this is that definitely the, the the match between your marketing and your your target audience matters. And if you're looking at trends. Uh, then this this hyper focus on specific niches or specific um, specific gamer profiles is going to become increasingly more important because if you have 10,000 games shipping on Steam every every year, you probably don't want to be one of the 500 2D pixel art roguelikes uh, that uh, that are launching that year. You might rather be the the one game that is a Mac junk for retired gamers in. Uh, Florida, Florida homes, and then that might not be a significant market now. But if you're thinking 15 years from now, everybody in those retirement homes will be a gamer, and they will have uh, disposable income to spend on video games. Just saying. Now we're saying ideas. Um, okay, so I, I see the time is is, is close to an end. Uh, maybe not fully, but. Um, so let's talk about what what's the future be like. We have so many platforms, different platforms today with uh, mobile c consoles, PC, board games, VR, AR. What's the future of, of gaming? What people here should focus on? Sure, easy. You know, let's, let's make it easy. Like, forget about PC, forget <laughs> about consoles, you know. 20 years in the future, you know, everyone has like this mobile phone in your pocket, you know. So that's the future, like... Uh, until, well, like I, 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 until Apple thinks you know, something new. That was funny, like I was like uh, um, uh, switching the phone recently and I was like uh, picking one of the phone and like, I look at the, um, the memory size. It was like, whoa, one terabyte. What is more than my PC? <laughs> it's like, what the heck? Mm -hmm. And of course, like uh, when, when I started like, thinking, okay, what about the computing power? Uh, okay, I can imagine that maybe in 15 years or 20 years, like computer, uh, computing uh, power of my mobile phone is gonna be pretty much the same like PlayStation 5 or whatever gaming laptop I have in my house. So uh, actually I'm gonna be able to play all of the PC and console games on my mobile phone. Of course the screen is super small, but what if I could stream this a uh, game to my TV screen and just, you know, have more that my mobile phone gonna be my, you know, gaming pad. Wow, that's quite nice. I only need to have one device, uh, not five different ones. So yeah, that's something I would, I would see in the future, to be honest. I don't believe like maybe in VR, I know that it's trending right now and you know, the numbers are quite promising. Uh, AR is completely dead, but I believe actually that AR are gonna be a big thing in the future. Right now we just don't have proper devices to use it and so on. Uh, but I really like to, you know, li uh, read science fiction or, you know, watch like so, some kind of cyber punk uh, setting movies and so on, and that's gonna be future anyway, so 
So and it's the same that for 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 the games, I believe. Magic? No war games. Sorry. <laughs> no. <board. laughs> yeah, I'll be more down to F here because, uh, like, I'm not going to talk about the very distant future. But in general, my one uh, simple and humble suggestion would be to not put all the eggs in one basket because uh, like we can see especially when it comes to community engagement uh, marketing uh, like companies have spent lots of money on bringing their community to facebook uh, and once they got lots of followers then facebook just uh, with one click uh, s like prevented them from reaching that uh, people without paying additionally so uh, like the more diversification you can uh, you can make the better just to make sure that if you are reliant on uh, external sources, and you are basically, because Steam has their own ecosystem, uh, consoles have, uh, each of them have, uh, has their own, so it's better to be on as many of them as possible, because you know this is like a very crazy times, um, and the situation changes, and you don't want to like, uh, focus your entire well-being, uh, your entire business on uh, on like one external platform that can collapse or uh, can change uh, instantly. So what you're trying to say is like, please have two phones, Android and... <laughs> <laughs> Tom? Uh, yeah, so from, from the perspective of PC, console, VR, premium gaming, especially indie and like double A's, uh, I would say long term, definitely retirement homes. Like that's definitely that's definitely the the niche to to be aware of. Uh, but actual actionable midterm and and short term, I think it's important to acknowledge that if you're starting now, it is super competitive on the marketplaces. It's only going to get more competitive as time goes on because game development, creation of video game is very democratized. It is very easy to get into and start making games. So uh, it's important to be super smart and also super lucky on the creative side. What game are you actually making? But then it's also starting to become basically a necessity to uh, then be excellent at all of the operations and running the business. So to be able to actually track uh, if your wish lists are going in the right direction, to be able to negotiate with, uh, with publishers or to be able to negotiate with platforms, to be able to make sure that all of your discounting pricing and everything else is in place. And if you're making a game, that is probably not just Steam, because if you succeed on Steam, you should already be working on uh, ports to other platforms because Steam only represents about a third of your potential revenue. And that might be the make it or break it for your studio. If your game is um, a hit, an absolute stellar success, then it doesn't really matter. Like you've already won. But most people don't have a hit. Most people uh, are lucky if they get something that is, that is good, that is, that is making numbers, but it is maybe not enough for you to hire more people. And maybe you're stuck in this limbo of our studio is too small to hire more people. Um, and, and it's kind of hard because everybody has multiple hats so nobody is focusing on anything and everybody's miserable. And the solution to that maybe is just take better care of your sales or port to switch and suddenly you've got this additional revenue you, you can hire a couple more people and every, everything becomes much smoother and that might be the make it or break it for your studio and I think this is becoming increasingly more important in the near future as everything becomes more and more competitive. Piotr, any final advice before the line of questions? Yeah, don't make games. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, I remind uh, I remind myself like I think I read new uh, news yesterday about Playtica. They the 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 CFO actually announced that they will not make any new games because the market is so saturated right now. The you know uh, in terms of the uh, mobile uh, marketing, uh, the outlook uh, landscape is like so dizzy for them right now. You you know you don't have like uh, right uh, data to assess if you are like, going good direction. So they said, okay, we will not produce any more new games. We will just acquire studios who have like successful games. That's better strategy for us. So if you decide like to make uh, mobile games, just uh, ask yourself if you have something in your hand to beat the Playtica. <laughs> uh, yeah, because since like big guys like decided that maybe that's not the right, the right time to produce new game, what do you have in your hands to decide that maybe you will success? Maciek, any advice? 
If not, I'll just give it one here. So. Yeah. Okay. But so maybe some questions from. Oh. <laughs> Great way, thank you. Uh, what do you think about metaverse in future? M metaverse? Yeah. Uh, nobody really knows what that word means. <laughs> uh, but uh, I mean, yeah, metaverse is, is so overused that it's now meaningless. But in general, my, my perception of VR and AR in terms of technologies and platforms, like is it worthwhile building up a skill set of building uh, immersive experiences in VR right now, thinking that maybe you can pivot into AR in the future? Absolutely, I have no, no doubt about that. That for now, uh, the, uh, in the short term, uh, if you, if you um, want to figure out what are the odds of metaverse or like VR, AR, metaverse things succeeding and becoming a relevant computing platform in the future, you, you should only basically look to does Mark Zuckerberg look like he's abandoning the, the project. And it doesn't seem like that. It seems like the entire Facebook behemoth has been transformed into meta for a reason and it's probably not going to uh, change. Uh, not until Mark Zuckerberg changes his mind because the entire company structure is set up so that he himself can make all of the decisions and nobody else can actually yeah. influence that. So for as long as he's hell-bent on making VR a reality and he's spending tens of billions of dollars making that happen, uh, then it will happen eventually. Thank you. <laughs> I'll add one thing because uh, what Tomek said is like to, uh, straight to the point that we don't know what it is and the problem with uh, buzzwords like that is if you really need to explain it, then people don't need it. Because uh, what, what is really every business on earth is actually based on needs. There is, there is a need, whether people knew that they has this, uh, have this need or not, but still it uh, like solves some kind of uh, issue that they've had. And with Metaverse, I don't know what kind of issue do I have without Metaverse. I don't know what, I, what do I need Metaverse for. What I know is that, yeah, okay, uh, if uh, ChatGPT was uh, alive when I was at school, then, yeah, I needed somebody to do my homework, for example, to, to do math or whatever. So, yeah, it's a great thing, and you can explain ChatGPT in one sentence, and it's, like, perfectly understandable, and you straight away take my money, this is awesome. Metaverse? Like I've uh, metaverse and the same uh, thing with blockchain. You would need to like spend with me like hours explaining that to me, and I would still not be convinced because I don't understand it. I don't know why do I need it, etc. By the way, we uh, we decided before uh, our panel that we are going to make a drinking game. That whenever uh, we uh, there is a word crowdfunding happening here, then left side of the uh, um, uh, of the audience drinks and uh, blockchain on the right side. So guys, uh, like, take your shots. <laughs> Still no blockchain, so... <laughs> I know, As metaverse, we forget about NFT and... <laughs> okay, uh, guys, actually, I have one question for you. Uh, you were talking about uh, video games to board games. What do you think about the other way around? Board games to video games. There are quite a lot of them. Uh, from the point of view of casual gamer like me, who plays them? Because I only play like few few games that I really played in like the board form and then abandon them. Do they bring uh, like new players or usually the players who play that played them in the board form before? So I can speak to their commercial potential. Uh, I've, I've, I've seen some of them uh, being extremely successful. Uh, a well-made port, I guess, of board games into video game format, especially the ones that were published in the middle of the pandemic, as you can imagine, uh, have done extremely well for themselves. That people were looking to spend time with other people. Not everybody you know is a gamer that you can just pull into a round of Fortnite but they will play a wingspan or a, a, a couple of hours of just mindlessly rolling dice and talisman. And those, those games have been doing really well for themselves. There are two types of these games, because first one is just you take 
board game directly to video game, and the mechanics are the same. You're basically like just uh, playing uh, like uh, via internet, and that's of course there are several. You don't need to actually put that games on Steam because you have so many uh, like special website services that will actually uh, grant you the access to many great board games, so that you can play with your friends from uh, from uh, overseas. But also there is like additional uh, like something that we what we can kind of see is that uh, board games are also IPs and you can build the entire like a huge game a very regular one on board game IP and basically of course it's going to if it's well uh, if it's prepared well then it's going to be far more successful far more popular than board game because you have billions of video gamers and not so many board gamers okay thank you very much and yeah question from the audience Thank you. I have many questions, but let's start with first. Uh, recently, I read uh, one research about escapism in game dev, uh, and it's idea that people want to uh, forget about our present crisis, etc. And do you think that it really happens, or is it just a, a nice slogan? I mean, have you ever played a video game? <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's obvious, like it is one of the, I, I imagine, main drivers for a lot of people. You have a stressful life, you, you have a stressful job, you come back and you want, to, you want to relax, put your mind on idle, basically, and just play something where you feel very much in control, you understand the rules, you've got this sense of mastery, it gives you satisfaction, stuff that not everybody has in their everyday lives. And I, I definitely, definitely see that, and especially, Everybody, everybody has, even if you've got the most satisfying, happiest job in the world, you're always going to have some rough patches and you're always going to have some challenges. And then being able to come home and relax with a game that you know and you've always, you've always played, the comfort of it. Yeah, I, that is I, I probably a very important aspect of motivation for a lot of gamers, why they pick up a specific game, which is also, by the way, interesting thing to think about when you're designing, uh, what is the psychology of your customer going to look like? So not just the person who's playing your game, but the person who's buying it. Why are they buying this in the, in the first place? Sometimes maybe because they want to escape reality and they have a specific fantasy that they want to fulfill. Thank you. And we have time for one more question. Thank you guys for this talk. I have such a question. I have a hypothesis that maybe because the audience of the gaming is uh, every year starting to increase and increase, we have more players and most of these players are coming from the casual side, maybe people who are uh, older than 50 and less than 15 or something like that. And so uh, I just think that the old games, including the PC games, started to become more Casually, we have a lot of even hardcore games like Witcher Free or something else that have the story mode, which allow you to play really casually. And uh, in the same time, not all the people playing mobile games they started to become PC games. And I just think that at some moment, maybe the game industry have to produce the game which is easy to play, uh, maybe hard to master, of course, in this case. And so hardcore gaming will be not so reliable for the market just because we have a more casual and diversative uh, audience. What do you, so my question is, what do you think about that? Uh, so, maybe I will start go ahead, like, uh, again. Uh, I think that what you said is like actually the structure of the market right now, like to be honest. Uh, it's obvious that going to be less players who are like more into like mid-core or hardcore games. And that's fine, but at the same time, they are more engaged and they are willing more, willing to pay more. So you know, from the economical side, it is fine. Uh, you know, usually, like, you know, like gaming, like I don't know, 20 years ago, of course, we didn't have like computers, so on. Like the the, the structure of the market uh, was completely different. You know, right now, you know, uh, we're like 30, 40, 50. We are gamers. We are uh, we are able to. Pay you know 250 is lot for uh, console console game. You know when I was a kid, uh, kid like a child, whatever, uh, I couldn't afford for that. To be honest, right now I can afford, but I don't have I don't have enough time to play it. So these games needs to be like uh, easier. You know I just want to you know relax, rest, escape, 
uh, and have write a nice story, not necessarily, uh, you know, uh, compete uh, and with other people and so on. I, I need to do that like every day, uh, trying to be like Playtick or Superstar. So <laughs> that's enough for me, uh, uh, to be honest. So that's, that's natural life, to be honest. And that's going to happen in, in, in the future, I believe. Uh, and I think another way that you can think about it is uh, through the lens of just accessibility. That uh, it is a just a smart decision to try and make your game approachable to as many customers, as many people as possible for them to be able to enjoy it. And if you only dial your game's difficulty level or level of skills necessary to a hardcore gamer level, or even if you expect or require that they understand how to use the, the gamepad, uh, because otherwise they get punished by the game, that already cuts a significant chunk of your potential player base out, that removes it, because not everybody is very savvy with a, 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 um, with a controller. Uh, and that is, you know, accessibility as um, defined not by just thinking about people who have disabilities wanting to play your game, but just understanding that now uh, the, uh, the player demographic is such a diverse environment. There's so many people from so many different walks of life. There's people who just want to relax after a hard day at work that are 45 and 55. There's people who've never played a game but were interested in playing the new Harry Potter because they read all of the books. And you really want to make sure that they are having a good time as well and they're not being frustrated because the troll keeps bashing them on the head and, they don't, and they're still figuring out which one is the right stick. Thank you very much, guys. Give a round of applause for our panelists. Thank you.